Hello, my name is Jay Aswara. I work at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and my focus is urologic trauma and reconstruction. And today we'll be talking about urologic emergencies. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Today we'll be covering three topics primarily. The first, renal trauma. The second being bladder trauma. And the third being urethral trauma. We'll go into depth in each of these topics, talking a little bit about the background, going through how to uh, preoperatively evaluate these patients, how to surgically manage them, and also how to uh, take care of their postoperative issues as well. Renal trauma accounts for 3% of all trauma in the U.S. 67% of all genitourinary trauma is uh, renal in origin. Because of the position of the kidneys in the retroperitoneum, blunt injuries are nine times more common than penetrating, but they're less likely to be clinically significant. Renal trauma is often associated with concurrent liver or splenic injuries, including injuries to other organs as well, such as the ribs. As we all know, the kidneys sit in the retroperitoneum. They're protected by the lower ribs, as well as by the liver, the colon, and the spleen. Gerotis fascia provides an envelope that compartmentalizes and tamponades renal bleeding when it occurs. While it's possible that gerotis fascia can be torn during an injury, generally the bleeding stays retroperitoneal unless the peritoneum is also perforated. And in that case, uh, the hemorrhage is, is no longer contained. However, if the retroperitoneum remains intact, the hemorrhage will be contained and uh, can be tamponaded. The classic presentation for renal trauma is flank pain, hematuria, and flank hematoma. However, this triad occurs uh, uncommonly in less than 15% of patients. Generally, hematuria only occurs if the collecting system is involved, and this often signifies a more severe injury. High-grade renal injuries frequently present with hemodynamic instability, as we shall see in the next few slides. Patients with lower-grade injuries may appear clinically stable, and renal injuries often occur in the setting of polytrauma especially in association with rib fractures. The proper evaluation for a patient with suspected renal trauma is a contrast-enhanced CT, or, in my opinion, preferably a CT urogram, which is a three-phase CT, the final phase being a 10 or 15-minute delay to evaluate the ureters. A contrast-enhanced CT or CT urogram should be performed if the patient presents with gross hematuria or if the patient has microscopic hematuria and has a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury. In addition, a contrast-enhanced CT should be performed if the mechanism of injury is suspicious for uh, a renal trauma, such as a rapid deceleration, uh, injuries to the flank, ribs, or lower chest. As I mentioned, I prefer a CT urogram because it allows imaging of both the kidneys and the ureters as well. The American Association for the Surgery of Trauma has created a five-grade scale for categorizing renal injuries, and we shall discuss these in the next few slides. This classification scheme is important for renal trauma because it helps dictate the method of treatment. Here we see a grade one renal injury. And grade one injuries are categorized as having a contusion or non-enlarging subcapsular hematoma with no clear evidence of laceration within the renal cortex. And as you can see, there's a nice smooth contour here to the renal cortex but you can clearly see that there is some bleeding within gerotis fascia. What you also notice in this CT scan is that the image, uh, is that the bleeding is contained entirely within gerotis fascia with the possible exception of a leak right here. 
This is a grade one renal injury. A grade two renal injury is defined as a laceration of less than one centimeter in depth that does not involve the collecting system and therefore has no evidence of urinary extravasation. In addition, these patients also have non-expanding perirenal hematomas. In this patient, you can see, again, here is the contour of the normal kidney, and you can see that there is a small uh, laceration into the renal cortex measuring less than one centimeter. You can see the perirenal hematoma here, again, for the most part contained within Gerota's fascia. This is a CT scan of a patient with a grade three injury. A grade three injury is defined as the laceration greater than one centimeter through the renal cortex uh, without extension into the renal pelvis or into the collecting system. And therefore, these patients have no urinary extravasation. You can see the defect in the kidney here. A grade four laceration extends into the renal pelvis or to the renal vessels with contained hemorrhage. You can see the laceration in this patient extends all the way into the collecting system. A grade five injury is defined as a shattered kidney or if the uh, renal pedicle is avulsed. In this image, you can see that uh, the patient has sustained uh, an injury of such force that the uh, the, the kidney is now shattered. Imaging should be obtained at 48 to 72 hours after the initial presentation uh, or sooner if there's a change in status, and that includes uh, fever, continuing blood loss requiring transfusion, worsening pain, or abdominal distension. Injuries from Grades one through four are generally managed conservatively. This is particularly true if the patient is hemodynamically stable. And the way that we de define hemodynamic stability is transfusion of less than uh, three units of blood on presentation. If the patient requires three or more units of blood at the time of presentation, the patient should be considered for angioembolization or surgery. If the Initial imaging shows a grade four or five injury. The patient should also be considered for angioembolization or surgery. And again, the decision between angioembolization and surgery is entirely dependent upon uh, the capabilities of your, of your hospital. Another area of, of uh, a debate is whether to stent or place a percutaneous nephrostomy tube in patients with a urine leak. Generally, this should only be performed if the patient has symptoms related to the urine leak. Generally, this presents as a chemical peritonitis. They have abdominal pain, distension, and, uh, and these patients often improve with placement of a percutaneous drain uh, or uh, having a stent or percutaneous nephrostomy tube placed. When considering renal trauma, there are a number of surgical principles to keep in mind. The main surgical principle to keep in mind is early vascular control, just like for any other vascular surgery, because in the end, uh, renal trauma should be thought of as a, a vascular issue. Another surgical principle is to debride all the devitalized tissue, leaving devitalized tissue behind uh, can pose problems as the patient heals. It's also critical to ligate any bleeding vessels. Sometimes this can be uh, a challenge when they're encountered uh, as identifying specific bleeding vessels can be, uh, can be challenging. Another surgical principle is to repair the collecting system in its entirety to prevent uh, continued urine leak, and if possible, the preservation of the renal capsule to allow closure uh, after the repair is complete. For renal trauma, it's critical that the operating room is prepared for all possibilities. 
I generally recommend that a vascular tray be available, including Satinsky's, Bulldogs, and other atraumatic vascular clamps and forceps. Vessel loops should be present. I like to use a ligashore uh, because I find this to be helpful when mobilizing the colon, although this is by no means essential. Uh, a stapler in case the kidney needs to be removed, and I like to use an articulated staple, uh, stapling device because of uh, the ease with which the staples can be placed. I also uh, recommend the use of straight and right angle clips uh, during this, this type of repair. Often in the setting of polytrauma, the patient's abdomen has already been exposed by our trauma surgical colleagues, but in the event that you are performing the index operation, make yourself a midline laparotomy from the xiphoid to pubis. You want a generous incision so that you can have proper exposure. Retract the bowel superiorly, and you can place it in a Bogota bag if you'd like, or an empty cassette tray. Once the bowel has been mobilized superiorly, the classical teaching was to incise the per posterior peritoneum medial to the inferior mesenteric vein in order to gain early control of the renal vessels. As you can see here, the per posterior peritoneum is exposed and you can see the aorta lying underneath. Here you see the inferior mesenteric vein and generally the incision was made right here between the aorta and the inferior mesenteric vein and that allowed early vascular control of the renal vessels. Another step that should be performed, if no preoperative imaging was available, if the patient was hemodynamically unstable and was rushed to the, to the operating theater, it's important to make sure that a contralateral kidney is present. Generally, this is done by either performing an on-table IVP with the uh, injection of two cc's per kilogram of contrast and uh, obtaining a, uh, a, an x-ray on the table or uh, more easily by palpating the contralateral kidney. Once you're sure that a uh, contralateral kidney is present, you can then uh, uh, mobilize the colon. Again, the key to the surgery is early vascular control. And classically, the teaching has been to uh, make an incision medial to the inferior mesenteric vein. But in truth, it's often easier just to mobilize the colon first, particularly on, on the right side. Once the vessels have been exposed, isolate the vessels with vessel loops. And I generally place Rummel tourniquets on them uh, and left loose so that the vessels are not clamped. You then mobilize the colon immediately, make an incision within Gerota's fashion. If brisk bleeding is encountered, you can gently place vascular clamps or a rumble tourniquet, which is my preference, on the renal vessels to uh, prevent the inflow of blood into the affected kidney. Remember that kidneys are acutely sensitive to warm ischemia. And so if you do clamp the renal artery uh, and renal vein during this procedure, you want to try to limit this to within 20 minutes. With the affected kidney exposed, uh, one decision to make early on is whether you can salvage the kidney or not, and whether a partial nephrectomy is necessary. If it appears as though a collecting system injury has been sustained, I generally close this using a running 2 0 It's important to ensure that the renal capsule has been spared because, again, you'll want to use this for your closure. Make sure that you've devitalized all, uh, debrided all of the devitalized renal tissue. If it looks as though the renal injury is too severe, certainly it is. Uh, in the patient's best interest to uh, have the kidney removed. I generally do this for patients with a shattered kidney or a severe grade four injury in which the bleeding cannot be uh, easily controlled. However, if the kidney is going to be uh, preserved, uh, 
it's important to be able to close the renal capsule over the defect in order to prevent continued bleeding. Once all the, once all the devitalized tissue has been debrided, I generally use a number of hemostatic agents, such as Surgicel and uh, Flow Seal, to augment the hemostasis. I then close the capsule using pledgeted 2O or O prolines on a CT needle in a mattress fashion. I usually use uh, Surgicel as my pledgeting material, and then I leave a drain in the retroperitoneum. Postoperatively, these patients are kept on bed rest and they're measured with Q to 6, 8 hour hematocrits. I generally re image somewhere between 24 to 48 hours, uh, depending on how severe the injury is. If it's a grade 1 or grade 2 injury, uh, you can sometimes space it out to 48 to 72 hours. Um, if it is uh, a very low grade injury, they're often out of the hospital by that time. But um, obtaining some type of follow up imaging is important to make sure that. There's no expanding hematoma or expanding urinoma. And remember that if the patient's symptoms change during the postoperative period, uh, one should obtain a CT at that time. Potential complications from renal trauma and, its, uh, and the surgery required to, to, to treat it are continued bleeding, and again, this is treated with angioembolization or uh, a trip to the operating room. This is all dependent upon what is available at your facility. I generally prefer angioembolization, um, and with the recent advances in vascular interventional radi radiology, uh, adequate vascular control can be achieved using this technique. If an attempt has been made at angioembolization and continued bleeding is occurring, then uh, surgery is required. Urine leaks and abscesses can occur, and these are generally treated with percutaneous drainage. A rare but uh, noteworthy complication is page kidney. When a kidney is uh, compressed by a hematoma for an extended period of time. This can lead to a hyperrenin state, which can lead to uh, chronic blood, uh, chronic hypertension, which is often um, unresponsive to medical therapies. We usually check a blood pressure at three months to ensure that the patient is not uh, becoming hypertensive, and if. Uh, if there is any evidence of a hyperrenin state, um, then, uh, then uh, removal of the hematoma becomes important. Oftentimes, the hematoma resorbs on its own and uh, does not require further treatment. For follow-up for these patients, I usually obtain a CT urogram at four to six weeks to ensure that uh, the hematoma is resolving, and again, obtain a blood pressure at three months to make sure that they're not in a hyperrenin state. Blunt and penetrating bladder trauma accounts for 80% of all bladder trauma. The rest is a mix of iatrogenic injuries and other, uh, other injuries. The main determination for bladder trauma is to identify whether it's extraperitoneal or an intraperitoneal injury. Extraperitoneal injuries typically occur in the setting of pelvic fractures, uh, often in association with posterior urethral distractions. Intraperitoneal bladder trauma often occurs from a direct blow, often uh, in the setting of motor vehicle accidents or, or other such trauma. Also, it's noteworthy that uh, these occur in the setting of a full, a full bladder. As we know, the bladder sits in the anterior pelvis. Anterior to the bladder is the space of retius, and it's important to remember that this is a potential space. Normally, this is, uh, this is collapsed, but uh, this is a potential space that can easily fill with blood from uh, bleeding pelvic veins. Injuries above the peritoneal reflection 
generally result in an intraperitoneal injury. It's also n n worth noting that extraperitoneal extravasation of urine is generally contained within the pelvis and therefore uh, requires a different management. An important anatomic consideration is that the bladder neck is generally fixed. So the uh, prostate and the membranous urethra provide an area of fixation while the bladder, which sits superior to them, is relatively mobile and uh, can be susceptible to trauma. Bladder trauma typically presents as hematuria. Often patients present with suprapubic pain or tenderness and an inability to urinate. Again, these often occur in the setting of pelvic fractures. If the patient has an intraperitoneal bladder perforation, they'll additionally have abdominal tenderness, guarding, and rebound tenderness. When considering a patient with possible bladder trauma, it's important to perform a digital rectal exam and a bimanual exam in women. The reason is as follows. One wants to ensure that there's no injury to the rectum or to the vagina. If there is a concurrent injury to the rectum or the vagina and there is any type of injury to the bladder, the patient should go to the operating room for repair of both. Uh, with interposition of, of some sort of viable tissue, such as peritoneum or omentum. The evaluation radiologically for patients with suspected bladder trauma is a CT or fluoroscopic cystogram. Generally, these are performed by instilling 400 cc's of, of contrast into the bladder. In some patients, however, uh, their bladders cannot tolerate such a large volume, and so uh, the contrast is instilled until they feel full. Imaging should be obtained in the setting of hematuria with a pelvic fracture, hematuria with any other concerning mechanism such as blunt trauma, uh, motor vehicle accident, if a fluoroscopic cystogram is performed, it's important to remember uh, to obtain emptying phase images to avoid missed injuries. If the bladder is not imaged as it is emptying, it is possible to miss images posterior to the bladder or near the bladder neck. At our institution, we typically perform a CT cystogram to avoid these uh, avoid these issues. Here is a CT cystogram showing an extraperitoneal bladder leak. As you can see, the bladder holds contrast, and you can see that there's contrast now outside of the bladder in the space of retius. Looking at the sagittal images, you can see that the urine leak is contained within the space of retius is, does not outline the bowel, suggesting an intraperitoneal bladder injury. Since the contrast is contained within the space of retius, this is a, an extraperitoneal bladder injury. This is a fluoroscopic cystogram, also showing an extraperitoneal bladder injury. You can see that the bladder is full with contrast, and you can see contrast, extravasation, outside the bladder, but contained within the space of retius, and again, not outlining the bowel. Here we see a CT cystogram of an intraperitoneal bladder injury. On the coronal images, you can see that the bladder is filled with contrast, and you can see that contrast is outlining the bowels within the abdomen. On the axial images, here again, you can see contrast outlining the bowel, suggesting an intraperitoneal bladder injury. This is an example of a fluoroscopic cystogram showing an intraperitoneal bladder injury. Here again, we see that the bladder is filled with contrast, and you can see that contrast spilling out and outlining the overlying bowel.
the surgical principles for uh, approaching patients with bladder trauma, all intraperitoneal bladder perforations should be repaired. Conservative management of intraperitoneal bladder perforations rarely are successful. And so it's imperative that intraperitoneal bladder perforations are repaired surgically. Generally, extraperitoneal bladder perforations can be managed conservatively with catheter drainage because all of the urinary extravasation is contained within the, within the pelvis. There are exceptions to this rule, however. As mentioned earlier, if the patient has sustained a concurrent rectal or vaginal injury, this should be repaired. If there are bony spicules or foreign bodies within the bladder, this should also be repaired. If there's a tear at the bladder neck, again, because the prostate and the membranous urethra are firmly attached while the rest of the bladder is mobile, this can lead to tears at the bladder neck. These should also be repaired. Also, if the patient is going to the operating room anyway for an ORIF or, uh, uh, or any other uh, abdominal pelvic repair, then a cystorophy should be considered. If there is a concurrent pelvic fracture, be aware that your incision can release tamponade on significant pelvic venous hemorrhage. Some surgeons advocate performing a fan and steel incision for this, uh, for this reason. I generally perform a low anterior uh, incision in the setting of bladder trauma. However, again, a fan steel incision could be helpful if one is concerned about significant pelvic bleeding. If upon entry, one encounters significant pelvic bleeding, rapidly pack the pelvis with lap pads in the right and left lower quadrants. If you place your two fingers, palmar surface down on the pubic synthesis, and sweep to either side, you'll be able to feel that the bladder has lifted off on one side more than the other. That side represents the, uh, the side with the significant venous bleeding, and that side should be addressed first by packing with lap pads. If significant bleeding has occurred and the patient's uh, bleeding cannot be controlled other than by packing. The patient should be brought to the uh, intensive care unit with the abdomen open with the uh, plan to take the patient back once the bleeding has stabilized. Assuming that no significant bleeding has been encountered upon entry and the bladder has been exposed now expose the peritoneal surface of the bladder. At this point, you have several options. If a single small peritoneal laceration has been sustained, this can be closed extravesically. Generally, in one or two layers, I typically use a running 2 0 or PDS. If there's any doubt in my mind uh, about the nature of the injury or the number of injuries, then I'll perform an anterior cystotomy and interrogate the bladder in this fashion. I place two stitches on either side of where I plan on making my anterior cystotomy. I then make a longitudinal incision along the anterior bladder wall. With the stay stitches, retracting the bladder uh, toward the ceiling. I then place my fingers within the bladder and sweep them along the bladder mucosa uh, to, to palpate for tears. This also allows me to visually inspect for tears within the bladder as well. Any tears I encounter, I close uh, using a running 2-0 bike roll or PDS, and I leave the knots on the luminal surface. I typically do this in a single layer. Also, if there's any concern about injury to the ureter, one can place 
uh, stents at this time since the ureteral orifices will be exposed via this uh, anterior cystotomy. I then close the anterior cystotomy in one or two layers and I cover the cystotomies with peritoneum or omentum if possible. A suprapubic catheter is generally not necessary in the setting of bladder trauma. A Foley catheter is nearly always sufficient to provide adequate drainage for these patients. I typically leave a, a pelvic 15 French Blake drain as well. Potential complications from bladder trauma and its resultant surgery. Again, if hemorrhage is encountered upon entry, pack the pelvis, resuscitate the patient in the ICU, and bring the patient back to the OR in 24 to 48 hours. Occasionally, a urine leak will be encountered after repair of the bladder. The first thing to do is ensure that your Foley catheter is not clogged. This can often be a source of consternation with tiny blood clots occluding the Foley catheter. I generally leave a large Foley catheter in for these patients, usually a 22 French or potentially larger, uh, to prevent this sort of issue. But it's worth remembering that gentle flushing of the Foley catheter uh, may, uh, may result in removal of a clot, and this can improve a urine leak. If you've done this and a urine leak persists, then a percutaneous drain should be placed. I typically obtain a cystogram at two weeks to assess the integrity of my repair. If there's a persistent urine leak, then I leave the catheter in for an additional two weeks and obtain a cystogram at that time. Nearly all uh, bladder injuries will have healed by that point. As mentioned, I typically obtain a cystogram at two weeks, and if it, appears, if it appears as though the repair is intact, then I remove the Foley. One consideration to uh, keep in mind in, is in patients who have chronic constipation. In patients who have chronic constipation, they often require uh, significant elevations in abdominal pressure in order to uh, defecate, and this can provide undue stress on your repair. In patients who have chronic constipation, I often will leave the Foley catheter in uh, slightly longer or ensure that they're on, uh, in addition to ensuring that they're, they're obtaining a, that they're undergoing a proper bowel regimen. Now on to urethral trauma. The urethra is classically divided into two regions, the anterior urethra and the posterior urethra. The anterior urethra, working from distally to proximally, consists of the penile urethra and the bulbar urethra, while the posterior urethra is uh, consisting of the membranous and the prostatic urethra. There are several types of injuries that can result in urethral trauma. Penetrating injuries are uncommonly a source of trauma for the urethra, simply because the urethra and the penis are mobile. Straddle injuries can be a source of anterior urethral injuries, uh, anterior urethral trauma, because the anterior urethra courses along the perineum in such a fashion that a straddle injury will result in a direct blow to the bulbar urethra. Pelvic fractures are a common source of posterior urethral injuries, and urethral distractions can be seen in roughly 5 to 10 percent of all pelvic fractures. As mentioned in the previous section, the bladder neck is a fixed point in the urinary tract. When trauma occurs, this can result in shear injuries of the prostatic urethra. The bulbar urethra courses deep to the peritoneum, and it's more commonly seen in uh, blunt trauma, such as straddle injuries. The classic triad for urethral trauma is blood at the meatus, perineal bruising, and a high-riding prostate. In truth, 
the digital rectal exam for patients with suspected urethral trauma often results in the uh, detection of a hematoma, it's rather uncommon to be able to palpate a truly high riding prostate. However, should one be encountered, that's a clear sign of a urethral distraction. The proper way to evaluate the urethra in the trauma setting is to perform a retrograde urethrogram, and the technique will be described uh, shortly. Alternatively, if that is not possible, a cystoscopy can be performed, but it, uh, with the following caveat. If a cystoscopy is to be performed, it should be performed with minimal fluid to prevent uh, fluid extravasation into the perineal planes. If at all possible, a retrograde urethrogram should be performed. The one advantage of performing a cystoscopy initially is that uh, a Foley catheter could be placed over a wire at this time. The proper way to perform a retrograde urethrogram is to place the patient in the figure four position. Often this is not possible in the setting of a pelvic fracture, but if possible, uh, this should be done. A wedge or blanket should be placed under the straight hip, and a 12 French Foley is placed so that the penis comes off at 9 o'clock. The Foley balloon is instilled with two cc's and inflated within the fossa navicularis. 50% contrast is instilled uh, into the urethra, and uh, images are obtained. Here, we see an example of a retrograde urethrogram showing a partial disruption of the posterior urethra. We know that this is a partial disruption because we can see some contrast making its way into the bladder. Here we see the bladder filling up nicely with contrast, but we do see contrast extravasating from the urethra within the perineal planes, suggesting a partial disruption. Here we see an example of a retrograde urethrogram showing a complete disruption. You can see the urethra filling with contrast up to the point of the bulbar urethra, at which point all the contrast spills out into the periurethral tissues. Surgical principles when considering a patient with possible urethral trauma. It's important to remember that early catheterization decreases the risk of stricture formation and potential future complications. There is some debate in the literature about whether a urethral catheter or suprapubic tube should be placed at the initial setting. My personal preference is to place a urethral catheter if at all possible. If it cannot be done because the patient is unstable or because of the uh, a complete disruption of the urethra, preventing realignment of the urethra, then a suprapubic tube will be placed at that time. Another surgical principle is that for penetrating trauma, one should minimize the amount of debridement performed on the penis and the urethra. This is generally well vascularized tissue, and uh, and min the uh, debridement of this sort of tissue can result in a much greater defect uh, that's more challenging to repair and uh, is often unnecessary since this tissue uh, can, be, uh, can be viable in the future. If the retrograde urethrogram shows a partial disruption, one can try gently passing a 16 French catheter. I typically use a coude catheter in this setting. This should really be done by the surgeon, um, and uh, this should be done extremely gently. There has been concern over the possibility of turning a partial disruption into a complete disruption, although no clear data have ever shown this to be the case, and so we still recommend that a, uh, a catheter be placed, uh, be attempted to be placed gently. If a single try at a catheter fails, uh, 
then a Foley catheter should be placed cystoscopically. If one is unable to cystoscopically place a Foley catheter, then place a suprapubic tube either in a percutaneous or in an open fashion. For percutaneous suprapubic tube placement, measure two finger breaths above the pubis within the midline. It's important to aim straight posteriorly with a finder needle. I typically use a, a spinal needle. If one starts to err either cephalad or caudad, one can encounter uh, either the bowel or the prostate, which can cause significant bleeding. So aim straight posteriorly. If previous abdominal or pelvic surgery has been performed on this patient, consider an open SP tube. Also, if the patient is going to the operating room for repair of other injuries, an open SP tube often provides an easy solution. If one is exploring a penetrating injury to the urethra, there's generally no need for primary repair except if there's an injury to the bladder neck or if the defect is greater than two centimeters in length. Potential complications from urethral trauma and the subsequent repairs. If the introduction of a finder needle is, uh, is noted to be within the bowel, simply do not dilate and remove the needle. It's okay to observe these patients. They do not necessarily need to be explored. If that tract, however, was dilated, then surgical exploration versus percutaneous drain placement is recommended. A long-term potential complication of urethral trauma is the development of a urethral stricture. These patients should be referred to a reconstructive urologist. It's important to remember that multiple dilations of a urethral stricture will worsen the scarring and uh, simply delay definitive treatment for this patient. Patients with urethral trauma should be followed for at least one year. I typically get a Euroflow, a retrograde urethrogram, or cystoscopy uh, every three months for the first year. If during the follow-up there is any suggestion of a recurrence of a urethral stricture, I will perform a cystoscopy at that time to evaluate further. So in conclusion, for renal trauma, the current trend is for conservative management. This is typically sufficient unless the patient is hemodynamically unstable. For bladder trauma, we typically perform a cystography for intraperitoneal injuries or complicated extraperitoneal injuries. And for non-complicated extraperitoneal injuries, Foley catheter drainage is often sufficient. For urethral trauma, early urinary drainage 